Well, I think the things that are wrong, first, basically, I think, would be the uh, violation of our open saloon. And the laws that says that the open saloon is hereby forbidden, either public or private. I think this is uh, uh, ignoring of very strict laws that we have by not only the ABC board, but by practically most of the law enforcing officers of the state. Well, I'm sure they'll try to pressure anybody they can to have the reduction on any law enforcement, but that isn't his problem. His problem is to enforce the law, regardless of whether they like it or not. I don't think it's going to bother the customers any at all. I really don't, you know, you know, because they're going to have to change. You know, people drink and they're going to keep drinking even though they can't get crowned. They're going to they're going to go to something else because you know that's not going to keep them coming out to the club and do their dancing and their drinking. People make a mass transit system work. If you don't have them, it doesn't pay to keep the system. And there aren't enough people for Route 18 of Oklahoma City's mass transit system. The route serves the Capitol Hill area, the city's south side. Ridership is low. And the Central Oklahoma Transportation and Parking Authority is considering cutting the route entirely. Uh, this route uh, is the one route that the trustees, uh, the Board of Trustees of COTPA, did not approve cancellation on the initial go-round. They approved the cancellation of five other routes. Uh, and we've been studying this route to try to determine if there was anything else that could be done. Uh, in our opinion, the route was just so, the staff of COTPA, the route was just not productive enough to continue the expense of, of operating the bus. But Capitol Hill area boosters say they are working on a revitalization plan. And for that plan to work, they say they have to have the buses. The capital area also recently has lost their post office. And they've lost, had their hours of the public library curtailed. Well, here we are with one hand trying to revitalize the neighborhood. At the same time, we have public services being taken away. And you can't do both. Something's got to give. The route also serves the city's growing Hispanic neighborhood, where they say 90% of the people work for minimum wage. They do not have cars and depend on the buses to get to and from work. But Copta says if they keep the route, other planned improvements in the system will have to be set aside. A final decision will be made on the problem on the 28th. Ted Brown, Action 4 in Capitol Hill.
It was just last Saturday that an accident sent three people to the hospital. The driver of a pickup truck smashed into a Mustang, knocking it down an embankment and toward the freeway. The accident happened at the Broadway extension in Britain Road. Police think alcohol was a factor. District Attorney Bob Macy thinks alcohol is a factor in too many accidents. So now a big crackdown is underway with some stiff penalties that Macy says no one will be able to escape. Uh, in checking with the people in the misdemeanor division and with the uh, young lady that runs the uh, driver school for drinking drivers, I found we keep handling the same people over and over. So what we're doing is not working. And if I'm going to make Oklahoma City a safe place to live, then people need to be safe from drunk drivers too. Macy's advice to drinkers is to have a non-drinker drive for them, or to take cabs, or just stay at home. He says the crackdown is long overdue and will be strictly enforced. As of this hour, 10 people have already been charged under the stricter penalties. Bella Shaw, Action 4. Today's testimony was the most revealing so far. Red Ivy painted himself as a respectable attorney who would never do anything illegal. He painted the same picture for State Senator Gene Stipe. The only difference, he said, was that Stipe had political clout. Taking the stand in his own defense, Ivy said he asked for $17,000 as an attorney's fee so that a fugitive wouldn't have to be extradited to Oklahoma. He said he asked for Senator Stipe's help because of his influence as a state senator and that perhaps he could influence the governor's office. But Ivy said he put that money into a trust account, and that's where it is today, and that Gene Stipe didn't get a penny of it. Ivy said he was hoping the fugitive wouldn't be able to raise that kind of money, $17,000, but Ivy said he had to charge a large fee because the fugitive owed him some money from previous cases. But upon cross-examination, the prosecution pointed out that it was highly unusual that Ivy hadn't put anything on paper not even giving the fugitive a receipt for his money. Still, Ivy insists everything was up front. Meantime, the prosecution is trying to point out conflicting statements Ivy made to the FBI. Ivy says he's talked to the FBI on numerous occasions, but in this latest case, he says it appeared the government was out to get Gene Stipe. Now it'll be interesting to see if Gene Stipe takes the witness stand for the defense of Red Ivy. Bella Shaw, Action 4, at the Federal Courthouse. On any given day, there are thousands of homes for sale in Oklahoma. High interest rates have kept many buyers from purchasing the homes they want. Likewise, sellers have been stuck with property they like to get rid of. In some states, homeowners have raffled off their houses through a lottery. The prospective buyer purchases a chance to buy a house for $50 or $100. After the tickets are sold, a drawing is held. The lucky winner has himself a new residence at a very low price. The seller gets rid of a piece of property which was hard to sell. Some realtors call lotteries a form of creative financing. The state attorney general calls them illegal. A recent attorney general opinion says the practice is against Oklahoma law. Home building officials say the prohibition against real estate lotteries could hurt home sellers in the near future. If interest rates remain high and the housing market continues to be sluggish, we already know the creative financing. We all read about it in the papers. We hear it on the news. And now that that's been used to the hilt and interest rates are continuing to be high, people are looking for other avenues. And this approach of lottery may be the next avenue that would become necessary for a seller to sell his home. The implications of the limiting nature of not being able to sell my house can really blow up into big proportions if this becomes a way of financing that is necessary in this community. Trammell says he hopes the Oklahoma real estate market will brighten soon so that homeowners won't have to consider using extreme methods to sell their homes. Scott Wallace, Action 4. Uh, uh, 
lawyers Kent Eldridge and Charles Cox came to the Capitol to announce that they had filed papers with the State Court of Criminal Appeals asking Hayes' execution be postponed on the grounds it was cruel and unusual punishment. The last time anyone was executed in Oklahoma was in 1966, but Oklahoma's new law requires death by lethal drug injection. Hayes would be the first to die that way, and that's why his case is so important. These attorneys were contacted by Hayes' family to try and stop the execution. Uh, like I said, we have filed an application for a stay of execution, both with the Court of Criminal Appeals and with the District Court of Muskogee County. We are hopeful that that stay will be granted, at which time he should be taken out of the death house and put back in the population there. All right, what did they... It's now up to three judges at the Court of Criminal Appeals to decide whether to postpone Hayes' execution. The attorneys want to exhaust all possible appeals at the state level. If they fail, they say they'll take it to the federal level, a place where Oklahoma's death penalty law has never been tested. Bella Shaw, Action 4, at the state capitol. Today, federal judge Ralph Thompson ruled that five members of the local PACO union are guilty of criminal contempt of court. On August 3rd, the court entered a temporary restraining order directing the controllers not to take part in the strike. And because the controllers never did report back to work, the judge said they were in contempt. Not the union, but the individuals named on the complaint. Defense attorneys argued how could the controllers be held in contempt when they were automatically fired for striking against the government. The president initially stated that if individuals were not back to work 48 hours after his statement, they would be dismissed. Subsequent to that, there was discussion uh, by the agency and maybe by the president relating to shift work, but that was after the president's statement. 48 hours after the president's statement, the Secretary of Transportation, Mr. Lewis, uh, advised that, quote, in his opinion, the strike was over, unquote, because nobody after that date would be rehired. A PACO member from Tulsa says to him the controllers continue to be misunderstood. Corey, we're all out here for $10,000, right? Wrong. We're out here because 9 out of 10 can't retire. That's why we're out here. <laughs> but, but you've been you led to believe it's a money issue. Uh, you've got to see the well, whole story. Well, I thought you wanted $10,000 more. That That's was in our contract, and that was our mistake for putting it in there. We want to uh, see if they'd talk about it. Uh, well, they said they wouldn't talk about hours of retirement. They wouldn't talk about anything. That's but, you know, marketing. we made a mistake there, but money was not the issue. Retirement was, always has been, they never addressed it. in Long Beach, California, Naval Hospital, which is the best in the country for eight weeks. I thought that was pretty good. It's only a two-week course. <laughs> you know, according to some people, Billy Carter just couldn't do anything right. And that was certainly true when it came to his own brand of beer. It wasn't on the market very long. But it's on the market again, this time on the collector's market. Look at all the ads for Billy Beer. Here's one collector's item. Billy Beer, make me an offer per can. Well, here's one that's a little more specific. Two cans of Billy Beer, excellent condition. $500 each or $950 for both. That's a deal? Here's the man offering that deal with his two precious cans of Billy Beer proudly displayed in the living room. What is your price and how did you decide on it? Well, in looking at the paper, the prices ran between five and $650 a can, and I decided that I'd play the low end of the market and advertised mine for $500 a can or both cans for $950. It seemed like that maybe that way I could get a break and get mine sold before the rush was over with. What do you think of the quality of Billy Beer? Kind of reminded me of something maybe that had been run through the horse about twice and then put in a pitcher and set out in the sun for eight hours before you tried to drink it. Rickard hasn't had any offers. He says the beers like the Carter administration. A lot of promise at first, but no payoff. Ted Brown, Action 4, in Nakoma Park.
at these uh, at these hard blocks. It's the classic setting, a smoke-filled room and people with a beer gathered around a pool table. But the people aren't just idling away their time, Eddie Parker is giving them lessons in physics and geometry. Fast Eddie Parker is a world champion we trick pool shooter. Is the one going? Yeah, yeah, yeah! yeah. Okay. He's been playing the game since he was nine years old, and he is good. For him, the balls will do things that look impossible. Pocket beers, which is the classical name for pool, it's a fantastic sport in all seriousness, and it's a sport in which men and women can participate equally, you see, because it doesn't require strength. It's a game of finesse, you see. And it is a sport that you can play until you die, so I would recommend that every single American start playing pocket beers. It's fantastic. Fast Eddie is retired from tournament play. He lives in Tulsa now and just does exhibitions. And make the 11 jump over the second stick into the pocket. By the way, despite the popular rumor, he says the movie The Hustler was not based on his life. Ted Brown, Action 4 from the Rose Cafe. Priests in Oklahoma are circulating a petition to all Catholic churches in the state calling for a full investigation into the Guatemalan slaying of Father Stanley Rother of Okarchi. The idea for such a drive was started by Reverend Paul Gallatin. Signatures supporting the petition started pouring in as early as yesterday from the western portion of the state. The letter has now been sent to the Tulsa Priest Senate, who will distribute it to the churches in eastern Oklahoma. All the names will hopefully be collected by September the 1st, then sent to President Reagan, Secretary of State Haig, Oklahoma Senators, and the Guatemalan government. Catholic Church leaders are not satisfied with the report that robbers, who were reportedly Rother's friends, shot and killed him. They feel there was foul play. Most definitely, yeah, I would say there was, yeah. The, the information we have, uh, Father Rother came home from Guatemala last January because he was on a death list, um, and he was told in March that uh, his name had been taken off the list, uh, so he went back, and uh, as it turned out, uh, his name was put back on the death list, apparently. McSherry says the Guatemalan government is interested in what the American government thinks of them and can come up with more information if pressured. If the petition is successful in getting a full-fledged investigation, maybe the so-called robbers will turn out to be government scapegoats. Carol Lambert, Action 4. The sign says, private drive, keep out. But that didn't stop them. The chain link fence with barbed wire across the top didn't stop them. The fact that they couldn't use the elevator didn't stop them. They climbed the tower. By elevator, it takes about 15 minutes to get to the top. Climbing to the top of the tower takes anywhere from three to four hours. Two skydivers jumped from the top of the tower shortly after 8 o'clock. Minutes later, two others jumped. Bernie Martin was near the tower feeding cattle when all this happened. I seen them while I watched them hit the ground. It was a pretty good show. And uh, when they hit the ground, they hit it running. So that kind of stirred my curiosity up. So I came down to the tower. And as I started to leave, well, off the tower came two more. And the last one that came off the top, he did a real nice free fall. It was real pretty. And, I got down here, but well, they didn't know anything about anybody being on their tower, and so we started uh, trying to get up there to catch them, and we got up there where well, the last two did a little better job of sailing than the first two, and they were back to the back of the fence, and there was a green van there waiting for them, and they jumped over the fence and got away. And... Martin thought Action 4 was doing some promotional work, but that wasn't the case at all. The police were called. Yeah, this is, they found a small plaque at the top of the there. tower. It says, the dreaded tower jump. 
or Revenge by Larry D. Jackson. Despite the fact that the skydivers were trespassing and that they could have damaged warning lights for aircraft, Transmitter Supervisor Bob Abla says the stunt was extremely dangerous. When somebody tries something like this, they don't think if the wind were to die at the moment they jumped, they, would, they could somersault just head over heels into the side of the tower. And the way these larger communications towers are built, with seven and a half feet between level struts, it's big enough for a man to get in and he would just get caught and it falling that, at that speed and that distance would kill him instantly. Or if the wind were to die after he got out, he's got no way to go except straight down. And then they don't realize that every 120 degrees around a tower, we've got guy wires spaced. And on our tower, there's seven guy wires. And you run into those, those things are about two inches or more in diameter. It's like hitting a brick wall. You'd get caught up in it and it would kill you. It's the most deadly thing, dangerous thing anybody could ever do. Abla says the people who jumped from the tower this morning must be crazy. Looking down, I certainly agree with him. Ben McCain, Action 4, 1,457 feet above the ground. Lawmakers will come back to the Capitol at 1 o'clock Monday for a five-day session dealing with the horrible scandal of corruption in county government. Governor Nye had said earlier a special session wouldn't be needed, but after talking with people around the state, he could see that it was. Well, what really changed my mind is that uh, I go out with the people an awful lot, and uh, people are just frustrated and want to know why we're not doing something about it. They want to know how can a person commit a felony, plead guilty, and say he's going to hold, continue to hold office. And it just uh, keeps mounting up. And when I start talking about a million dollars in special elections, and I think of all the things we can do with a million dollars. The special elections are expensive. Election Board Secretary Lee Slater. Cost is going to vary uh, somewhere between probably half a million dollars as a minimum figure and perhaps as high as a million dollars as a maximum figure until you know where the vacancies are going to occur and who actually files for those offices, it's, it's almost impossible to pin down a precise number in advance. Let's take a look at where we stand now. With Representative Don Federson's admission of guilt today, 38 commissioners have now entered guilty pleas, affecting dozens of counties. Six suppliers have also been caught up in the scandal, and the governor's had to call for 16 new elections. The governor says he would like to appoint some people to replace the resigning commissioners, but he's sure to receive criticism from Republicans who will think the appointments are stacked against them. In the meantime, this scandal has now rocked the state in such proportions that it's going to take taxpayers' money to settle it once and for all. Bellashaw Action 4 at the state capitol. Governor Nye's uh, three years in office has been one characterized by dodging issues, avoiding controversy, so that he might maintain his nice guy political image. It's time that we come to grips with these important issues in the state of Oklahoma. The people of Oklahoma deserve these answers. Our campaign is going to bring those answers to the people. And win, lose, or draw, we intend to accomplish the objective of bringing these issues into clear focus and requiring the politicians of this state to stand and be counted. Two bedroom at 1675 a day. Now they said they might have some this afternoon so you might want to call them for a second. This is part of orientation for air traffic controller trainees arriving in Oklahoma City, whose first task will be a tough one, finding a place to live. There's only a 2% vacancy rate for hotels and apartments in the city, and the FAA is encouraging students to be roommates if possible with other students.
Lloyd Taylor drove up from El Paso, Texas, and has started making phone calls to apartment complexes around town. So far, no vacancies. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if you still have a one-bedroom furnished apartment left. He's checked out of his motel room this morning and has no idea where he's going to sleep tonight. Taylor and other students have much of their personal belongings in their cars now, but hope the housing shortage problem is solved soon. Um, I mainly just brought clothes and, you know, any sort of personal stuff that I wanted. Uh, I didn't bring dishes or, you know, I brought some towels and sheets, but um, certainly I'll have to find a furnished apartment, and an unfurnished wouldn't wouldn't do well for me, but the Academy has given us uh, some places that rent furniture to you for about 40 a month. So, so they, um, they take care of you really in all aspects. But the problem is really only starting. Come October 1st, more than 400 more new students are going to be looking for furnished apartments. Chances of them all finding a place doesn't look good. Ed Stewart, Action 4, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City has known for a while now that it has a real problem when it comes to getting rid of treated sludge. The city produces 45 tons of sludge every day from its sewage plants, and sludge pits simply can't handle the load anymore. But officials think they have come up with a solution. Today, city council voted to use the services of BioGrow Systems if an acceptable one-year contract can be worked out. BioGrow is in the business of using sludge for land application. City leaders also figure it will be cheaper to use BioGrow than to truck the sludge to pits. Council members hope that eventually all city sludge can be spread over land to serve as fertilizer because farmers know it will do the job and it will solve the sludge problem. But just in case BioGrow can't find enough farmers to participate in the program, city officials are not ruling out the possibility of still using landfills. No one is more concerned about the possibility of using sludge pits than residents of Forest Park. That's because this site near Forest Park at Northeast 36th and Mosley will likely be used as a sludge pit if one is needed and Forest Park doesn't want it here. Ed Stewart, Action 4 in Northeast Oklahoma City.